We know that both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, will have to receive the mark in the right hand or in the forehead. In order to decode more about this mark, I think it's important to consider the source of it, Satan. And we know one thing for certain, Satan imitates God. I think most Christians look at the book of Revelation and realize that this is our time of emancipation from Satan's world. And we know that the Bible always answers its own questions. So I went back to the first emancipation from the land of Egypt in the book of Exodus. Also in chapter 13 in Exodus, I find the Lord speaking to Moses. In verse 7 and 8, we see that unleavened bread should be eaten for seven days, the leaven, of course, representing sin and corruption. And the children should be told about this practice and the fact that it's done because of what the Lord did for the people. He emancipated the people from Egypt. Verse 9 explains that this practice shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes. And the Lord's law may be in thy mouth, for with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Exodus 13 and 16 says, It shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes, for by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. This, I believe, is what Satan is trying to copy with his mark of the beast. The word frontlet, or H2903, tuta fof, is defined as to go around or bind. This practice, literally interpreted, is done with devout Jews today. In Deuteronomy 6 and 8, it says, Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. They're binding the words, as said in verse 6. This image shows what this looks like and explains that it's worn as a reminder of God and to follow the Jewish law daily. It's a pretty common sight in Jerusalem. The word itself, tutafof, has a biblical usage of bands, phylacteries, frontlets, and, notably, marks. In Exodus 13 and 16, they use the word token, or H226. It's defined here as a signal, flag, beacon, monument, omen, prodigy, evidence, and it can mean mark, miracle, ensign, or sign and token. Again, the word H226, oath, has a biblical usage that includes a distinguishing mark. In Exodus 13 and 9, we find a memorial between the eyes referenced. That word H2146, or zikaron, is defined as a memento, memorial, record, and its root, H2142, means properly to mark, so as to be recognized. As we see, the definition of mark is in all of these words, frontlet, token, sign, and memorial. Now, if we go back to the book of Daniel, we find him interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. This is especially helpful because the dream describes the kingdoms, the beasts. Babylon is represented with gold, silver for the Persians, brass for the Greeks, iron for the Romans. Each subsequent kingdom made of a stronger material representing control, but of a lesser value, representing perhaps the continuing deterioration of society's morals. 
The last kingdom is the one with iron and clay. We, of course, are the clay, the potter's clay. In Daniel 2 and 43, we see that the mixture does not cleave to one another. This could denote a weakness in the structure in the kingdom. It could also denote an intervention that is required to put those two materials together since they do not cleave, that is, they don't stick or cling or adhere to each other. And this is why many people feel that the mark of the beast will be a physical stamp or inserted item. The technology for RFID microchipping is moving forward daily. We don't hear that much about it anymore, but it is moving forward to be sure. Biohacking, transhumanism, these are some other names that you'll hear. Even the DHS has looked into using RFID to track individuals. And there is an active patent dated back to 2007 to track information about medical devices in patients. So the technology has been there for a while, and it's definitely not going away. Very recently, we've also been hearing about Elon Musk and Neuralink. Things are moving forward there very quickly. <laughs> this is our little device. Uh, it is, that, that thing at the bottom is just to hold the threads in place because they're just like little fine wire, wires. Um, I mean, fr frankly, to, to sort of simplify this, uh, what, what we're, <laughs> I mean, it's more complicated than this, but it's, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like a Fitbit in your skull with tiny wires. Our, our current prototype, version 0 0.9, has about 1,000 channels, uh, so that's you know, about 100 times better than the, the next best um, uh, consumer device that's available. And it's a 23 millimeters by 8 millimeters. It actually uh, fits quite nicely in your skull, because your, your skull is about 10 millimeters thick. So uh, it fits, it's, it goes flush with your skull, it's invisible, and all you can see afterwards is that there's a tiny scar, and if it's under your hair, you can't see it at all. In fact, I could have a neural link right now, and you wouldn't know. The, the installation of a link done in under an hour. Um, so you can basically go in in the morning and leave the hospital in the afternoon. And it can be done without general anesthesia. So this is our surgical robot. And we actually ultimately want this robot to do uh, essentially the entire surgery. Uh, so in, in everything from, from in, incision, uh, removing the, the skull, inserting the electrodes, placing the device, um, and then um, closing things up and having you ready to, to leave. So we want to have a fully automated system. And we're making good progress towards clinical studies. Um, I'm excited to announce that we received a, a breakthrough device designation from the FDA in July, uh, thanks to the hard work of the Neuralink team. So, so I want to be clear, we're working closely with the FDA um, and we'll, um, we'll be extremely rigorous. In fact, we will, um, we will significantly, significantly exceed the minimum FDA guidelines for uh, safety. We will make this uh, as safe as possible. We've all heard by now about Facebook's rebranding. Meta is the company's new name, and they are focusing on the metaverse, the virtual reality future of working and staying in touch with your family and friends. We've gone from desktop to web to phones, from text to photos to video, but this isn't the end of the line. The next platform and medium will be even more immersive, an embodied internet where you're in the experience, not just looking at it. And we call this the metaverse. And you're gonna be able to do almost anything you can imagine. Get together with friends and family, work, learn, play, shop, create, as well as entirely new categories that don't really fit how we think about computers or phones today. Imagine you put on your glasses or headset and you're instantly in your home space. 
It has parts of your physical home recreated virtually, it has things that are only possible virtually, and it has an incredibly inspiring view of whatever you find most beautiful. Last month, we launched Ray-Ban Stories, our first smart glasses in partnership with Essilor Luxottica. They're not full AR glasses yet, but they let you take pictures and videos, listen to music, and take phone calls while you're out looking at the world instead of down at your phone. And we built leading privacy features into the glasses, like the LED light whenever you're recording, which phones don't even have. And we delivered this in the iconic Ray-Ban style for just $2.99. And we believe that neural interfaces are going to be an important part of how we interact with AR glasses. And more specifically, EMG input from the muscles on your wrist combined with contextualized AI. It turns out that we all have unused neuromotor pathways and with simple and perhaps even imperceptible gestures, sensors will one day be able to translate those neuromotor signals into digital commands that enable you to control your devices. It's pretty wild. So let's take a look at what EMG input is going to be able to do and where we are with it today. This video shows some of the ways that we think that wrist-based neural interfaces can provide an important input tool for AR glasses. So at first, that input is going to just be around enabling basic gestures, click, scroll, select. But as the technology evolves, EMG input could potentially unlock full-speed typing, and it could give you subtle, personalized controls that you can use in any situation. This is genuinely unprecedented technology. picturing this movie right about now. Uh, things are moving along very quickly and the virtual reality accessories interestingly cover the head, the forehead, and the hand, the right hand, sometimes both hands. So let's recap. Satan loves to imitate God with the hope of taking over. Phylacteries and frontlets, by definition, are marks, so the possible implementation of the mark could be quite different than I've always assumed. Daniel's dream tells us that the final kingdom will be one of iron and clay. We are the clay, so the iron is the beast system that will somehow be integrated with us. And the technology direction of society through implantations in the hands or in the brain with Neuralink, as well as virtual reality expansion, all affect the exact areas that God asked the Hebrews to remember in Exodus, and all the areas that the Antichrist will tell, I should say force, his followers to mark in the end of days. We are told that in the end, those that are meant to go into captivity will go. Those that kill with a sword must be killed with the sword. And most importantly, the saints have to have patience and faith. We know this, of course, but I wanted to share the concordance definition of faith with you. Persuasion, that is credence, moral conviction of religious truth or the truthfulness of God. And highlighted here, especially the reliance upon Christ for salvation. So let's all keep the faith. Until next time.